Greetings, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Turn your King James Bible to the book of 2 Kings. We're going to read chapter 24 and starting in verse 1. Now, realize that in previous study that we covered that the Lord had promised that he would take Jerusalem away to Babylon. It was prophesied. Well, guess what? Now it's going to happen. A lot of people don't know it, but uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the ruler, the king of Babylon, actually wrote one of the chapters in the book of Daniel. I think it's number four. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know if uh, Nebuchadnezzar, well, I mean, you know, under direction of the Holy Spirit, was he saved? I don't know. But there's a very distinct possibility that he was. So, the book of Daniel covers the captivity, what they were doing when they were in Babylon. You know, the Lord told them, you go to Babylon, marry, have children, build houses, plant vineyards, because you're going to be there for a while. And they were told they would be there for 70 years. Now, when Daniel, Daniel must have been a, a really pretty young when um, they were carried off to Babylon. And... Uh, I, to my knowledge, there's no information of him actually returning to Jerusalem. I mean, you got to figure, if he was, you know, 15 years old, 70 years, he'd have been 85 when they would have returned to uh, Babylon. But he might have actually been like 20. So, I mean, you know, 90 years old going back, back to Jerusalem? I don't know. But... Uh, I don't think he returned to Jerusalem. I really don't. I think he died just before that happened. I'm not sure. Um, you know, I'm kind of a generalist, a generalist when it comes to the Bible. I don't specialize in any one particular area. Uh, so I try to know a little bit about everything. Uh, what is that? Jack of all trades, master of none. Well, I don't know if I'm a jack of all trades when it comes to the Bible, but, you know, I try to know a little bit about everything so that at least I know where to look and I can look up things if it ends up being important. So, uh, all right, so let's go to 2 Kings chapter 24. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim became his servant three years then he turned and rebelled against him, the king of uh, Jerusalem, Jehoiakim. And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldees. Now the, uh, the Chaldees were part of the Babylonian Empire. I don't know if they were the same people or just uh, conquered, but the Babylonians and the Chaldeans, so... Uh, and the Lord sent against him the uh, bands of the Chaldees and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the children of Ammon and sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord which he spake by his servants the prophets. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he did. Now we read about Manasseh in a previous study. Not good. And also for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Yeah, there comes a point where uh, the Lord's patience runs out and it's judgment time. And give this a modern application. I think that this applies to the UK, the EU, and the USSA. 
uh, the United Socialist States of America. At least that's what I call them. Verse 5, Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Jehoiakim slept with his fathers, and Jehoiakim, ugh, some of these Hebrew words, Jehoiakim, his son reigned in his stead, and the king of Egypt came not again any more out of his land, for the king of Babylon had taken from the river of Egypt unto the river Euphrates all that pertained to the king of Egypt. So Egypt uh, had diminished as being a world empire. There was a time Egypt was a, a major world power because of the Nile River, which would uh, flood the croplands. And let's face it, if you've got uh, fresh water, you got crops. You can grow crops. You may not have crops, but you can. You can grow them. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months, and his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. Boy, that word evil, that, that keeps popping up, doesn't it? At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehulachin, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers, and the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. And he carried out thence all the treasures. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord as the Lord had said. And he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths, none remained save the poorest sort of the people of the land. Now, who's the poorest sort of the people of the land? Well, they're the people that don't have anything, right? Probably the land farmers. So, you know, when you've got uh, people who are planting crops on the land you don't want to you don't want to take the farmers away you know you want them to keep doing what they're doing so you can uh, tax the tax the food and, uh, and the crops and bring it to Babylon right at least that's what I'm thinking that's what I would have done if I was uh, the king but farmers are uh, never 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 it seems like they're never wealthy. So perhaps they were the poorest of the land. And you want to leave them there so they can continue working, right? And he carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon and the king's mother and the king's wives and his officers and the mighty men of the land. The, those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And all the men of might, even 7,000 and craftsmen and smiths a thousand, all that were strong and apt for war, even them the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. And the king of Babylon made Mataniah, his father's brother, king in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Now, I don't think this guy was, when he says it was his father's brother, I don't think it was the king of Babylon's um, father's brother. I think it was the king of Israel's father's brother, but I'm not 100% sure about that. And changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 20 and 1 years old uh, when he began to reign, and he reigned 
11 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jeho Jeholakim had done. For though the anger of the Lord, oh, I'm sorry, for through the anger of the Lord, it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah until he cast them out from his presence that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Not a very smart move. I mean, here it is, Babylon had conquered Egypt and carried away everybody from Jerusalem, and you think you're going to rebel against this guy? Ah, yeesh. Verse 25, chapter 25. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came he and all his host, oh boy, that's like a all his army, right? Came he and all his host against Jerusalem and pitched against it, and he built forts against it round about. And the city was besieged unto the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. Uh, so basically, they besieged it for over a year. And on the ninth day of the fourth month, famine prevailed in the city, and there was no bread for the people of the land. Well, of course not. When there's a siege, they surround the city, and they don't let any food in. Oh, the farmers are bringing food for our army that were surrounded the city with. Isn't that nice? Thank you very much. And the city was broken up, and all the men of war fled by night by the, by the way of the gate between two walls, which is by the king's garden. Now the Chaldees were against the city round about, and the king went the way toward the plain. And the army of the Chaldees pursued after the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army were scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon to Riblah, and they gave judgment upon him. And he slew, he killed, and he slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with fetters of brass and carried him to Babylon. That's not very nice. That's what happens when you uh, rebel against the king of Babylon here. When the Lord prophesies, it's going to happen. Not only kills your children in front of you, but then he Pull, plucks out, you know, puts out your eyes so you're blind. So, and in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which, uh, which is the nineteenth year of King Bab uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came uh, Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem. And he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great man's house burnt he with fire. And all the army of the Chaldees, which were with the captain of the guard, break down the walls of Jerusalem round about. Now, why did they do this? Well, you tear down the walls. Well, you can't defend the city anymore. So, I guess... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had had enough of uh, trying to put up with this troublesome city, right? Now the rest of the people that were left in the city and the fugitives that fell away to the king of Babylon with the remnant of the multitude did Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carry away. But the captain of the guard left to the poor of the land to be vine dressers and husbandmen. Vine dressers, you know, like the the grape vineyards. And husbandmen has nothing to do with, you know, being married to a wife. It's uh, somebody that takes care of the fruit tree orchards. Possibly the vegetables, too. I'm not sure, but. And the pillars of brass that were in the house of the Lord and the bases and the brazen sea that was in the house of the Lord did the Chaldees break in pieces and carry the brass of them to Babylon. 
and the pots and the shovels and the snuffers and the spoons and all the vessels of brass wherewith they ministered took they away and the fire pans and the bowls and such things as were of gold in gold and of silver and silver the captain of the guard took away the two pillars one sea and the bases which solomon had made for the house of the lord the brass of all these vessels was without weight in other words it was a really heavy stuff a lot um All right, so let's skip to verse 24. Uh, this uh, Jedaliah was the uh, governor. And uh, Je Je uh, Gedejiah swore to them and to their men and said unto them, Fear not to be the servants of the Chaldees, you know, the Babylonians. Dwell on the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. So he told them. You know, this is from the Lord. Do it. You know, serve the king. Don't be afraid. Just, you know, go do it. This is from the Lord. Be obedient, because this is from the Lord. Verse 25. And it came to pass in the eleventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishema, of the royal, of the seed royal, came and ten men with him and smote Gedaliah that he died, and the Jews and the Chaldees that were with him at Miz Mizpah. And all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the armies rose and came to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans, of the Chaldees. They went to Egypt. God said, don't go to Egypt. Go to Babylon. Eh, we don't want to listen to the Lord. We want to do what we want to do. That was their thing, right? And it came to pass in the seventh and thirteenth year of the uh, captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the twelfth month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, that evil, evil Merodach, evil Merodach, what kind of a name is that? E V I L Merodach, evil Merodach. That's all one word. It's not saying Merodach is evil, but that's his name, evil Merodach. King of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, did lift up the head of Jeho uh, Jeholachan, king of Judah, out of prison. And he spake kindly to him and set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon and changed his prison garments. And he did eat bread continually before him all the days of his life. And his allowance was a continual allowance given him of the king, a daily rate for every day, all the days of his life. So this must have been the king that was just before Nebuchadnezzar. That's a something that's uh, kind of unusual about the Bible, is that sometimes it'll talk about the present, then it'll talk about the future, and then it'll go back to the past. And this is going back to the past. So kind of interesting how it does that. All right, let's read the parallel account of this in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. This makes uh, what we just read uh, more clear. Then the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's stead in Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was twenty and three years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. And the king of Egypt put him down at Jerusalem and condemned the land in an hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. So in other words, uh, they had to pay a tax, I guess, to the king of Egypt. And the king of Egypt made Eliakim, his brother, king over Judah and Jerusalem and changed and turned his name to Jehoiakim. And Nietzsche took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him to Egypt. Huh. Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, 
Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in fetters to carry him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. So can you imagine that? All the stuff that was dedicated to the Lord ends up going to the heathen satanic temple in Babylon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim uh, and his abominations, which he did, abominations, which he did, and the which was found in him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, and Jeho Lachin, his son, reigned in his stead. Jeho Lachin was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Oh boy, here we go again. And when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord made Zedekiah his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. Now that makes it clear. Zedekiah was the brother of the previous king. Now that makes sense. The, it was confusing reading that in 2 Kings. But this makes it clear. Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign and reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil, evil, in the sight of the Lord his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet. Ah. See, Jeremiah was a contemporary with all this mess going on. And we read some of Jeremiah in uh, the previous studies of this series. And humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. So not only was the king bad, but the people were bad, and the, and the priests were bad. Bad news bears. Wow. Verse 15. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people, and on his dwelling place. Who are the messengers? The prophets. Verse 16, But they mocked, but they mocked the messengers of God. Sound familiar? And despised his words, and misused his prophets. Yeah, they killed the prophets. Uh, where have we read that before? Huh, let's take a look real quick. Well, I guess the great authority would be Jesus. Um, how about Matthew 23, 37? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Oh, Jerusalem killed the prophets. Well, the book of Revelation says Babylon killed the prophets. So what does that mean? A equals B, which e B equals C. So A must equal C. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Jerusalem killed the prophets. Uh, it wasn't, uh, if you were one of the Lord's prophets, you didn't usually have a very long lifespan. So, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 16, But they mocked, mocked the messengers of God, and despised his words, and misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no 
remedy. In other words, it was Curtin's time for the show. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. And the, all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of, and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God, and brake down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And they that had escaped from the sword carried it away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Ah, there we go. See, it was the Persians that um, conquered Babylon. From what I understand, Babylon had a very great wall. And they had a river that ran through Babylon. So, from what I understand from history, the Persians blocked up the river upstream. They created a dam. And then the water built up, and it built up, and it built up, and it built up until it finally, the, the dam couldn't hold back the water anymore, and it just came rushing in, smashed against the wall of Babylon, and just obliterated it. For the those of you that don't know it, a gallon of water weighs 8.34 pounds. And you take uh, water, you know, one gallon of water, you start talking about thousands of gallons of water traveling at 20 miles an hour or 30 miles an hour. That's a lot of force, people. That's a lot of power right there. Knocked, uh, knocked down the walls. So... Um, now, what happens to the men that are on the walls guarding it? Well, when the walls come down, the men guarding it come down too. So the Persians took uh, Babylon, and then um, they let the uh, children of Jerusalem go back to Jerusalem. Well, guess what? Who is modern-day Persia? Iran. Did you know that? Iran is modern-day Persia, well, at least the, the geographical era, era, area. I don't know if the people are. I mean, you know, how much mixing has happened in, you know, over 2,000-something years, maybe, you know, 2,500 years. I don't know. But, uh, you know, you think, that the uh, you know who's if they were really Judah uh, would show kindness under the Persians for allowing them to return but um, I don't think they are who they say they are so alright so when the reign of the kingdom of Persia came that's when they were allowed to return and rebuild the walls at Jerusalem, rebuild the city, and rebuild the temple. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. One score is twenty. So three score would be sixty and ten. That's seventy years. What was a Sabbath? Seven year. Uh, well, seven. Every seventh was the Sabbath. So... The land kept the Sabbath for 70 years, so that was 10 Sabbaths. Uh, 
I don't know why 70 years. I'll be honest, I don't know why 70 years. I know it was 70 years, but I don't know why 70. Why not 68 or 72 or 77? I don't know. Uh, 50 years is a jubilee. And every 50 years, uh, there was supposed to be a jubilee where all the debts were forgiven. So, all right, verse 22. Here we go. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, now some people are uh, they're trying to compare Trump with Cyrus for uh, moving the capital of the Israeli state from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, everybody thinks it's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And I agree, it is. But um, read the parable of the wheat and the tares, where God gathers the tares to be bundled, to be burned. That's the prophecy I think are being fulfilled, not the regathering of Israel. No. I think God's gathering the tares. But... Uh, that's just my opinion. So when people say, yeah, this is fulfilling Bible prophecy, I'm like smiling, shaking my, nodding my head going, yep, it sure is, but it ain't what you think it is. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. There you go. Now, I, I hope to that you know about uh, the book of Daniel. I think we're going to read a little bit about Daniel. I'm going to cover a few things, I guess. All right, we're going to skip around a little bit. I'm going to read part of uh, Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jeho Lake Kim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave uh, Jehoiakim, Kim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. The land of Shinar. Where do we read about that? Hmm. All right, well, let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 10 real quick. Uh, it just, uh, the, you know, we're talking, um, about Noah now, right? Verse one, Genesis 10, verse one. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, who was the chosen seed, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, remember Gog and Magog? That comes from Japheth. Uh, and Medai and Javan. From what I understand, Javan uh, has reference to the area around Greece. Uh, the sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Medai and Javan and Tubal and Meshech and Tyrus. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz. Do you know there's a branch of Jews called Ashkenazi Jews? And uh, it's spelled A-S-H-K-E-N-A-Z-I, Nazi. Ashkenazi Jews. Look it up. There's two major branches of Jewry, the Shepardim and the Ashkenazi. The Ashkenazi 
are the ones that come from um, the area around Ukraine, Poland, Germany, Russia, that area. They're your Eastern European Jews that predominantly speak Yiddish. And they are, by far and away, the great majority of Jewry in the Middle East, in the Israeli state. And guess what? They're of Japheth. They're not even of the chosen sea line of Shem. Boy, bring that up in your Bible study at your local church and you'll get thrown out the door. Oh, but everybody knows that they're the of the, the chosen seed line. Uh, not according to their own writings. They even admit in their own writings. You know? And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togomar, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Tarshish, uh, Kittim, and Dodomim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. And the sons of Ham, remember, Ham's not kosher, right? That's a joke, people. Cush, Mizram, Put, and Canaan. I think Mizram is associated with Egypt, if I remember correctly. And the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Ramah, and Sabteca, and the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Boy, there's a whole lot of uh, mythological stories about Nimrod, and he's not a very good character according to legend. You know, the Bible doesn't say a great deal about him. But listen to this. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Was he a hunter of men's souls? Could be. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. 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 Remember the Tower of Babel? There you go. The beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel. Babel. And Erech and Akkad and Cana in the land of Shinar. Didn't we just read about the land of Shinar in um, Daniel 1? Yeah. A lot of scholars think Babylon was Babel. Was Babel. They think it was the same. It was the Babel. Babel was the, uh, in the land of Shinar, was the beginning of uh, the root of Babylon, you know, where the Lord, where they wanted to build a, uh, a tower, you know, up to heaven. I guess they were building their stairway to heaven. And the Lord said, nope, you ain't going to do that. Sorry. Um, and he confused the languages and he scattered everybody. So, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Iraq and Akkad and Cana in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went for, out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh. Nineveh was the uh, capital of the Assyrians. They were the ones that took uh, uh, northern Israel into captivity. Uh, and I think that's enough. I made my point. Oh, and then you can read about all the Canaanites if you keep reading. And uh, Lord didn't have 
very much good things to say about uh, the Canaanites. So let's go back to Daniel chapter 1. Uh, and verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar. Okay? Shinar. To the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs. Uh, remember, a eunuch was to be somebody inside the king's palace serving the king. And the king had all his wives running around. And uh, he didn't want to take a chance that his wives would be cheating on him with, you know, his servants. So uh, how did they solve that problem? Eunuchs. A uh, little snip snip there. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. So evidently, Daniel is never recorded as having, having had children. I wonder why. Uh, verse 4. Children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and wit, knowledge and understanding science, and such as had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace, whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So not only are they going to learn, they know Hebrew, but they're going to learn uh, the Babylonian Chaldean language. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the princes, uh, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave name. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and unto Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. Probably serving pork, right? Nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of Enix that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto David, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should... He see your face as worse liking than that than the children which are of your sort. Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Now, from what I understand, pulse is like sprouts and beans. So, I guess it's a type of, maybe it's a type of vegetarian diet. I don't know. Uh, people, listen. If you um, are ever without meat, you can take grains and mix it with either seeds or beans or peas, legumes, and they will produce a complete protein. For example, corn with peas, or corn with beans or seeds, you know, like almonds or sesame seeds or, you know, something like that. But not just corn. I mean, it could be wheat, it could be oats, uh, any grain, any cereal type grain, rice, uh, because there are, if memory serves me correctly, there are eight essential amino acids. There are amino acids that the, the body needs to complete making protein for your organs. And 
grains are high in all the amino acids except for one and beans are high in the essential amino acids except for a different one so when you mix grains with beans um, the beans give the amino acid that the grains doesn't have and the grains give the beans what the beans don't have so they complement to each other it's sort of like a lock and a key but you you can't eat grains for breakfast and then beans for dinner it do, that doesn't work you got to eat them both at the same time for it to work so that's how you would um, that's how you would do vegetarianism um because there might come a time when you don't have meat now the 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 uh the bible teaches that in the latter days there would be doctrines of devils i'm not advocating vegetarianism but if you didn't have meat if the stores quit selling it or for some reason you were unable to procure meat uh, rice and beans would be a viable substitute it's not a high quality protein but it's a medium quality protein you could survive on it uh, so but uh, people that are going uh, the Bible teaches that uh, people that go to vegetarianism it's a doctrine of devils uh, if you're doing it for health reasons that's one thing but if you're doing it for religious spiritual type reasons because you want to save the animals that's a doctrine of devils and honestly I think there will come a time when the Antichrist the man of sin the son of perdition the beast will enforce that I'm not sure but that was a big thing in the New Age movement that I was kind of dabbling in back 30 something years ago praise the Lord he saved me out of that garbage so prove thy servants I beseech thee ten days and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink then let our countenances you know look at our complexions then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat the pork and as thou seest deal with thy servants so he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days and at the end of ten days their countenances countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse as for these four children God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams now at the end of the days that the king had said he would bring them in then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar and the king communed with them and among them all was found none like Daniel Hananiah Mishael and Azariah therefore stood they before the king now you better believe uh, the princes of Judah you know the king's family in Judah were given an ex excellent education they were going to learn you know everything pretty much I mean you know they're not going to be working out in the fields picking apples or grapes you know they're not going to be doing that they're not going to be doing dirt farming work they're going to be taught sciences and mathematics and language and warfare and you know everything everything a king uh you know the princes have to learn as much as they can for the affairs of state they probably knew some things about agriculture but you know they're not going to get their fingernails dirty no therefore stood they before the king and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm and Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus Cyrus was the Persian remember that he was the one that conquered Babylon and 
at the end of 70 years, let Judah return to rebuild Jerusalem. Keep that in mind. Now, remember something, people. The, um, when we're studying, you know, if when people want to study Revelation, for example, the book of Revelation, which means to reveal, and I hear people all the time saying, well, I don't understand the book of Revelation. Well, have you ever studied Babylon? I mean, you know, the book of the the word revelation means to reveal. How come you don't understand something that means to reveal? Well, it's because you've never studied the Old Testament. You know, people say, well, you know, Mystery Babylon. And then they, they pick every place to be Mystery Babylon except for what the Bible says it is. Babylon, physical Babylon, was destroyed. And the Lord said it would never be inhabited again. Where do we find that? Jeremiah 51, 29. Jeremiah 51, 29. And the land shall tremble in sorrow, for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon, to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. Huh. Jeremiah 51, 37. And Babylon shall become heaps, a dwelling place for dragons, an astonishment, and an hissing without an inhabitant. And then you got these stupid uh, TV preachers writing books saying, oh yeah, well, you know, uh, what was it, King Hussein? Oh, he's going to rebuild Babylon. Uh, you know, I mean, they're deceivers. Nobody can convince me that they're not deceivers. I mean, you've never read this stuff? Really? These people are, are have doctorate degrees and... They don't know that Babylon would, physical Babylon would never be inhabited again once it was destroyed? Really? If you want to know about mystery Babylon in Revelation, study physical Babylon in Kings, Chronicles, Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah. You know, you see... It was spiritual Babylon that came out of Babylon. And who carried spiritual Babylon out of Babylon? Well, I mentioned it in my previous Bible study, but there's a book called The Tall, T-A-L-L, -L, uh, and Mud, M-U-D. So you take Tall, and mud, make it one word, delete one of the L's, yeah, and then it's called the Babylonian tall mud, yeah, it came from Babylon. In Jesus' day, they called it the traditions of the elders. You know, Jesus didn't speak very kindly of their traditions. They call it the oral law. Yeah, like God didn't want them to write it down, so he just told them in their ear, and then they copied it later. Well, you know, it's... Uh, and Jesus condemned them for the traditions of the elders. That's what came out of Babylon. Oh, and that word, the tall and the mud, means learning. So the Babylonian tall mud, delete one of the L's, uh, means Babylonian learning. Learning from Babylon. Mystery Babylon. But that can't be the case. You know, people, the Bible tells you that Mystery Babylon 
in the book of Revelation, kill the prophets. And then Jesus tells you that Jerusalem killed the prophets. What do they believe in Jerusalem? Not the, not the Torah. No, they don't believe the Bible. Their book is the Babylonian tall and mud. Delete the L. Make one word. That's what they believe. That is what they believe. It's the opinions of rabbis, not the word of the God, the Tanakh, or, yeah, unbelievable. And, uh, and then they'll try to convince you it's New York City, it's, it's Mecca, it's Istanbul, it's, you know, it's everywhere, oh, it's Rome, it's everywhere except for where the Bible tells you it's at. Yeah. And when they build a temple, if they do build a temple and the man of sin is standing in the temple proclaiming himself that he is God, where is that going to be? New York? No. London? No. Mecca? No. Rome? Well, they want to convince you it's Rome, but it's not. Istanbul? No. No, it's going to be at Jerusalem. You know? That would be the ultimate blasphemy by... The devil himself, proclaiming himself that he is God, sitting in the temple of God. Oh, yeah. Listen to this. Jeremiah 51, verse 7. Jeremiah is a depressing book to me. Depressing. Babylon hath been a golden cup. A golden cup. Jeremiah 51 7. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad, not angry. Therefore, the nations are mad, crazy, insane, you know, not. Oh, the nations are mad. They're, they're angry. No, no, no. Is there a second place in the Bible where it talks about a golden cup? How about Revelation 17 and verse 4? Speaking of mystery of Babylon. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Wow. How does that work out? Yeah. See, Babylon, you know, all, there was a, some TV preacher wrote a book that uh, King Hussein was going to rebuild Babylon and it was going to rule the earth with the Antichrist. You know, I wish I wish people would pick up stones and kill the guy, you know? I mean, really, but, you know, you can read anything. I mean, they can write and read anything because people are, they have no idea what the Bible says. None. I mean, I don't, I don't consider myself a scholar or a theologian. I'm just some guy that's read it, you know, the Bible a couple times. That's all. I mean... And the Lord's blessed me with a memory. I can remember where a lot of stuff is. All right, so. All right, let's read Daniel chapter 2. I really wasn't uh, going to get much into this. I've read this in a previous study, but we're doing on the temple. And uh, we're doing the Babylonian captivity. So let's do the Babylonian captivity. Now, remember, in chapter 1 of Daniel, it said that he had um, the ability for dreams. So, all right, Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep brake from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Saucers, 
the Satanists, right? And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit is, was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac. I'm thinking that's the uh, Syrian language. O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. Uh, I'm thinking, he's saying, I don't remember the dream anymore. I've had that happen to me, too. I'm sure it's happened to other people, too. Sometimes I can remember dreams, and sometimes I remember having it when, as soon as I wake up. But then an hour later, it's like it's gone. But he knew, Nebuchadnezzar knew he was troubled at the dream. So, what's his solution? The thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Uh, you're going to need a lot of cows to make their houses a dunghill. But if ye show me the dream and the inter per interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that ye would gain the time, because ye see the thing is gone from me. But if you, but if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. Oh yeah, till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I will, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. That's right. You know, if if you can remember the dream that he forgot you most certainly won't be able to give them the interpretation of it. So, The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asked such thing at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is no none other that can show it before the king except the gods. Except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Listen to this carefully. For he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. That's right. God removes kings. God puts kings in their places. He puts them up. He takes them down. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went into, unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, 
Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Latter days, the, the, the last days. What shall be in the latter days? Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. See, Daniel ties right into the book of Revelation. And then people say, oh, I read Revelation, but I don't understand it. Well, have you ever read the book of Daniel? Uh, no. Did you ever read Isaiah? Uh, I, I, what? What? Isaiah. I, I, I say what? Uh, no, I haven't read that. Really? Really? There's, you know there's prophecy in Genesis? The very first book of the Bible, there's prophecy in there. There's prophecy in Exodus, which Moses gave to unto the children of Israel. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, duh. You know, it, it's one whole book. It's like... It's like a cloth. It's all woven together. All the threads tie into each other. Verse 29. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me... This secret was, is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold. Now, gold uh, sometimes, oftentimes, represents the Lord in the Bible. Um, remember, Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Remember, you know, the Lord sets up kings, the Lord removes kings. Keep that in mind. Uh, even Satan does the will of the Lord uh, at times. Uh, it probably wasn't his will to all the things he's done, but, you know, I mean, the Lord uses Satan for his purposes. I know it sounds weird, but it's true. I mean, let's face it. Before the Lord created Adam and Eve, Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. Before he even created the earth, he was made a sacrifice for us. Lord must have known something was going to happen before it even happened. He made provision for us before, before he even created the earth. He made provision for us to be reconciled unto him. If that's not foreknowledge, I don't know what is. And then people say, ah, well, I don't believe in foreknowledge. You know, that's Calvinism. You're going to tell me the Lord doesn't know who would come to him and who wouldn't? I mean, Jesus said uh, to Judas, uh, about, about Judas, not to Judas, but about Judas. He says, have I not chosen you twelve and one of you is a what? A devil. 
Because he knew what Judas was going to do. He allowed it to happen. Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Oh, yeah. You know, but they want you to think, well, well you know, uh, I don't know. I, I hate getting into arguments about, you know, Calvinism and what they call uh, Arminianism, uh, which is what they call free will. That's one of those fancy $20 words that they use in a Bible college. Calvinism is uh, election and predestination, you know. I don't know. But uh, the images, this image's head was of fine gold. His breast and his arms of silver, his bellies and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands. Now remember, the stone the build, which the builders rejected, the same became the head of the corner. What was that? That was Christ. Paul said, uh, the rock that followed Moses, uh, that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Well, that's what it's talking about here. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. This iron and clay is going to be the end time kingdom of the beast. And the stone, which is Christ, the rock, is going to smash it to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That's right. Christ's kingdom is going to fill the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the king of heaven, I'm sorry, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. The God of heaven gave this to you, Nebuchadnezzar, don't it? Do you ever forget it? But he, he will. But he's going to be corrected. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, and for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwelt, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, forasmuch as iron breaketh in pieces and subdue all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, forasmuch as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. I want to make a comment here. The first time you see reference to iron in the Bible has reference to Cain and his children being the users of iron. Think about that. Think about that. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom 
which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Uh, then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Which means that uh, basically he was the king's right hand man, I guess you could say. Now, chapter 3 of Daniel is where uh, Nebuchadnezzar sets up the, um, the statue, the image. 66 cubits. Yeah. And uh, he tells everybody that they have to worship the image. And, uh, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't do it. And what does he do? He throws them in the furnace. And uh, then they see, well, there's a fourth guy in the furnace. What? And he looks like a unto the Son of God. And then he uh, tells them, uh, come out of the furnace, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing everybody knows this story. And I've already gone an hour and 15 minutes on this. Bible study, so, you know, I'm kind of doing the the Cliff Notes version, I guess you could say. So, here it is, you know, Nebuchadnezzar tells them to come out of the furnace, and then he promotes them. And he realizes that the God of the Hebrews is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Now, listen to this. We're only going to read part of chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all people, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the, that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house. Guess what? Nebuchadnezzar wrote Daniel chapter 4 under probably the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. And then uh, he tells the story from his point of view. So, you know, think about that. Babylon was a golden cup in the hand of the Lord. Now, most uh, Bible scholars will agree on the following. Well, the Bible tells you the head of gold of the image that uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw that a head of gold was Babylon. I mean, even the Bible says, you know, thou art that head of gold. Um, and then this, the um, silver, the arms of silver were, um, and the chest were uh, Persia. And then the brass was Greece. And then the iron, the legs, were Rome. But then the feet, part clay and part iron, a lot of people say, oh, well, this is the revised Roman Empire. Well, this is where I differ. Um, 
it's going to be something totally unlike anything we've ever seen. But uh, I don't know. I think it's going to be the war head of the world government's going to be Jerusalem. That's my opinion. Where the um, the beast is going to rule from. We shall see, won't we? Now, yes, I know, 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. All right, so... Yet in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, this is why people try to tell you that uh, all this was written before 70 AD, so that they can tell you that this was just predicting what happened in 70 AD when the Roman army came and destroyed Jerusalem. And they can say, oh, all that has passed. That's all past. Well, if you say everything was past, I think that's wrong, but if you say everything that happened like in Matthew 24 was all future, I think that's wrong too. I personally think it's a combination of both. Part of it was fulfilled in the past, part of it's going to be fulfilled in the future. Um, how are things going to work out? I don't know, but when it does, it, will, it should fit like a, a hand into a glove when we see it happened. All right, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. What's the topic? The coming of the Lord Jesus here, right? That ye be not soon shaken of mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Okay? The day of Christ is at hand. The second coming. That's what this the topic is about. The subject. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day. What day? The second coming. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Alright. So the second coming. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Before Christ returns, the son of man of sin, the son of perdition, has to appear, also known as the Antichrist, the beast. Okay? Uh, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. See, there are people that want you to think that all this happened back in 70 AD. Do you see the coming of the Christ? Did you see coming of Christ? I didn't. The Bible says that every eye shall see him. Did you see him? Uh, if you saw him, well, I didn't. Every eye is going to see Christ when he comes. And there, there are people that will tell you that this happened in 70 AD. This has all been fulfilled. This is done. Are, are those people devils or what? No. I don't think the man of sin came. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not when that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed, that he might be revealed in his own, in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Did that happen in 70 AD? Uh, no. 
even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe that all this happened in 70 AD. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you. Oh my God, that's Calvinism, Chaplain Bob. I don't believe Calvinism. Well, I don't know. I, I've never really read Calvin. You know, they call it Calvinism. If you believe in God having a chosen people, well, they have to be the you-know-whos. They're not allowed to be Christians. No. Christians can't be chosen people. No, 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 no. That, that goes against everything. You, that's not allowed in church. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, I think we're the chosen people. What do you think? I think God hath chosen us from the beginning for salvation. I have no idea why he would choose me. Believe me, I have no idea. Nothing I ever did was worthy of any of the least of the mercies the Lord has ever showed unto me. I mean, if I was God and some of the stuff that I had pulled when I was younger, I, I think I would have killed me out of hand. I mean, just unbelievable. So, if you want to know what end time Babylon is going to be like, you got to study what Babylon was like in the beginning. You don't go to the end of a book and read the last chapter and think, oh, I'm going to, you know, skip the whole book and I'll just read the end and I'll understand everything. It don't work like that, people. Come on. Come on. All right, let's read Daniel chapter 5, and we'll close this out. All right, so Nebuchadnezzar's dead, and uh, his son's taken over. And uh, Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. Oh, really? You're going to drink wine and praise your gods with the, uh, the temple cups from Jerusalem that were dedicated to the Lord, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Ah, oh, let's see how that works out. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods, plural, of gold and of silver and of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Boy, that must have been some good wine, huh? Oh, man, I, don't, I think I'm going to quit drinking this stuff. I'm, ugh. Verse uh, 6, then the king's countenance was changed. Oh, we're reading Daniel 5, by the way. Daniel 5 and verse 6. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins was loosed, and his knees smote one against another. His knees were knocking people. The king cried aloud to bring in, uh, in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet, 
and have a chain of gold about his neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Scarlet, color of royalty. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was king Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance which changed in him, and his lords were astonished. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever, let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. I suspect this is the mother queen. I suspect she's the, uh, the old wife of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. That's what I'm suspecting. Um, all right, so now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father, the king I say, thy father made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Forasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams, and showing of hard sentences hard sentence, sentences, uh, like a prison sentence, you know, like a judgment, a judge in a court, and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel, which art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of Jewry? I have even heard of thee. Oh yeah, I bet you you have heard of him. I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers that have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I have doubt, uh, and I have heard of thee, that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now, if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck, and shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known to him the interpretation. Oh, this is going to be good, huh? All right, verse 18. O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty, and glory, and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he slew, and whom he would, he kept alive, and whom he would, he set up, and whom he would, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Uh, this is part of a story we didn't. I, I skipped over because, you know, this is not, I, I could spend hours doing just, bab, you know, Daniel. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed it over whomsoever he will. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. Oh yeah, you better believe King Nebuchadnezzar, when he was humbled of the Lord, told his son all these things. But thou hast lifted up uh, thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines, have drank wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, and of brass and iron and wood and stone, 
which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whom, in, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Meany, meany, fickle, up, harshen. This is the interpretation of the thing. Meany, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Fickle, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Ah, then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, and put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the, of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median, Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. Now you had Cyrus and you had Darius. Honestly, I've looked it up. I'm not sure if they're the same person with a different name or if one was the king and the other was a general. I'm not sure. Um, you know, I read a little bit of different stuff. So, all right. So, in the previous studies, we learned why God cast away Israel, why God cast away part of Judah, why God cast away Jerusalem, 70 years had passed for their captivity, and now uh, Babylon, they had spent 70 years in Babylon. Now, personally, 70 years, all the people that were in Jerusalem that were evil were probably all dead. If they hadn't been slain by the sword, uh, they had spent 70 years in captivity because the Lord was trying to beat the wickedness out of them. But instead, they uh, brought Babylon with them back to Jerusalem. And uh, I guess we're going to do, what is it, part six? I think uh, we'll cover Ezra and Nehemiah when they return to Jerusalem, they rebuild the law, uh, they rebuild the wall, and they rebuild the temple. So that'll be the next lesson. Because we've already done, oh, over an hour and a half. So, all right, so they went to Babylon, spent 70 years there. Babylon was destroyed. The Medes and the Persians uh, conquered Babylon. Now it's time for them to return back to Jerusalem, and the second temple will be built. So, all blessing, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now that takes some foresight, right? All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen.